dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. In chapter 7 of his book, Rules for Radicals, Saul Alinsky unveils what he is most famous for, the rules for victory that radicals can follow in organizing a community for change. These rules have sparked much interest and debate for many years because they're both practical and successful. But are they in a line with the gospel? And where can we both learn from them and also do better. Thanks, everyone. I'm so glad we're at the heart now of our class on the Rules for Radicals with Saul Alinsky. And looking at this, not from an educational point of view, because actually we don't, we don't really want to be educated too much by these rules. Honestly, we, you know, uh, there's a lot better we can do as followers of Christ and as leaders uh, according to the spirit of the gospel, than to follow the rules for radicals. But we do want to be aware of them because on the other hand, they represent for us a real example of successful worldly thinking. And this successful worldly thinking, why wouldn't we try to employ it the best that we could, purifying it if wherever possible, and it's not always possible, but wherever possible, from what is imperfect in it, so that we too can be, well, effective in our leadership in this world. We all know that our hearts are in heaven, our minds are in heaven, that we follow the light of faith, and yet to learn how the world operates, isn't that part of being what our, our Lord called us to be when he said, be as sly as serpents and as simple as doves? Isn't this part of being sly as a serpent to look out there and say, yes, this world is passing away, and yet, yes, this is how this world operates. And I think if nothing else, it will really shed a light on the forces that are also operating in our own minds. There are people in the world that are operating according to these rules. And when you see it happen, it helps for you to be able to detect it, understand what's at the heart of it, so that you can either avoid it or you can at least be aware of its influence in your own lines of thinking. Because when I read this, and, you know, reading Saul Alinsky has been a really amazing experience for me. I, I've learned a lot uh, from him about how our world works. And in reading it, I've, I, you know, you start to recognize your author. I've done some research before I did these podcasts on him as a person. I've watched him in interviews. And it's in this chapter, chapter seven, that his style is just becomes full. This is the, here you're listening to Saul Alinsky where he is strong. In other areas, he's not as strong. You know, it was always convincing, but you kind of feel in the book he's stumbling along a little bit. When he gets to chapter seven and eight, boy, it, this is where, this is his sweet spot. And he put it at the end of the book because this is obviously also where I think the point towards which he was driving us. He lays out here what the name of the book is all about, Rules for Radicals, and he lists, lists them off for us. And I want to just begin by, by pointing out just how vehement Solovinsky is about victory. And reading this kind of convicted me as a Christian. I, I, I thought to myself, am I as vehement for victory as he is. When you start off as an entrepreneur, for example, in your business, you're focused in on everything that you need in order to succeed. It's like, a, it's like the big booster rocket in the space shuttle and all systems are firing, everything is a go, and you need that drive in order to, to take off. And that drive means sometimes you have to sacrifice things, you sacrifice your health a lot of times, a lot of you, sacrificed your health. 
And, and you sit there going like, I gave everything to be at the spot where I am today, the spot of success, right? But looking back over it, you, I wonder if you have the same tactic, the same drive for things that are spiritual. I mean, when we look at the f- culture in our families and the culture in our home, could we say that we are as aimed and as focused on what will bring success there as we are aimed and focused at what will bring us success in our business. I remember speaking to a family whose grandfather had founded a very uh, successful chain of restaurants. And they, they tell stories about how that grandfather would micromanage every detail and he would tell the grandkids who were working in the restaurants how to work, how to take orders, how to fulfill the orders, how to ap- operate at every level. And that, that's what made him so successful. He was absolutely driven that this restaurant would be everything that he knew and felt it could be, not in an egotistical way, but in the way of saying this is what success requires. There's an instinct in successful business people that when they're successful, they followed that gut instinct. It's almost like a running back trying to make it through the line of scrimmage and you see the hole and that ability to feel where the pressure is going to give and where the hole is going to develop and how, what speed you need in order to hit that hole at just the right time. Well, that's the, the, the genius of a running back and the genius of business is very similar. What's the market waiting for? What's the timing that I can deliver? How can I, how can I use my resources and at just the right amount at just the right time in just the right way to create the desired effect? And a lot of folks, it's just pure instinct because there are so many factors involved that you almost need a supercomputer to compute it out. But a successful business person knows it. They hit that market. They hit that corner. They know where to go next before others even get there. Now, my question is, couldn't we apply that to the other things in life? Couldn't we apply that to how we spread the gospel, for example? Wouldn't it be amazing if we could sit down and actually analyze and think to ourselves, where do the people need the gospel to be preached? How do they need it to be messaged? What are they looking for? What are they afraid of? analyze our, the field of evangelization like Solinsky would analyze his opponent, uh, like, a, like a champion of any sport would analyze their competition, and to, and to make a targeted strike where the church would proclaim the gospel as the world was waiting for it, looking for it, needing it to be proclaimed. Well, we'd be successful, wouldn't we? Not just in evangelization, but then you could go into your own family. You could look at your own relationships and you could say, what is it that my spouse needs? What does my marriage need? Let me analyze the situation. Let me look at it and see what my tactics are that I need to deploy. I guess when I read Alinsky here in chapter seven and eight, I was blown away by the fact that this fellow was driven by one single desire and that was to win. It was to win at all costs and at any cost. He wanted the goal so badly that he was willing to appear, as he says, he's willing to appear disorganized. I'm going to quote for you from the beginning of chapter eight because it's just a a wonderfully well-written phrase. He says, the greatest barrier to communication between myself and would-be organizers, so read that as would-be leaders, arises when I try to get across the concept that tactics are not the product of careful, cold reason, that they do not follow a table of organization or a plan of attack, accident, unpredictable reactions to your own actions, necessity and improvisation dictate the direction and nature of tactics. Right? He's, he, it's almost like what Bruce Lee said when he said, you have to be like water. Right? You have to be able to flow and to change to be able to meet your enemy. He says elsewhere the same type of thing. Listen to this. The major problem with trying to communicate this idea is that it is outside the experience of practically everyone who has been exposed to our alleged education system. The products of this system have been trained to emphasize order, logic, rational thought, direction, and purpose. We call it mental discipline, and it results in a structured, static, closed, rigid mental makeup. 
even a phrase such as being open-minded becomes just a verbalism. Happenings that cannot be understood at the time or don't fit into the accumulated educational pattern are considered strange, suspect, and to be avoided. For anyone to understand what anyone else is doing, he has to got to understand it in terms of logic, rational decision, and deliberate conscious action. Therefore, when you try to communicate the whys and wherefores of your actions, you're compelled to fabricate these logical, rational, structured reasons to rationalizations. This is not how it is in real life. Alinsky wants real victory. And so he focuses us to accept the way real life is and adopt the tactics to the fluidity and the unexpected nature, unanticipated nature of the circumstances of events. Quoting Abraham Lincoln, he simply says, I let the events control me. And again, my plan is to have no plan. On the one hand, I think this looks like weakness, but on the other hand, it also looks like a recipe for success. And I want to go deeper into that. Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org. That's E-A-G-L-E-E-Y-E ministries.org. And subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. Subscribe today. All right, so studying together rules for radicals here, and, and just again in the light of Christ and in, uh, in uh, of our faith, what does this fellow tell us? Number one, he's describing the tactics of success in the world, and in, especially not just in the world in general, but in the world of political change. Okay, so we're subject to this on a constant basis because. We are following a media and a generation of people who have learned these tactics. And when you read them, you sit there and shake your head saying, this is exactly what I'm exposed to every single day on the news. And I just need to make that comment to you guys so that you are aware of this and, 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 and alert. The news that we listen to on a regular basis has been affected by this way of thinking. It is not a presentation of truth as an objective fact. I mean, some of it is there, but by and large, the news we're listening to when it comes to political commentary anyway, is focused in uh, as a tactic being used in order to influence us to action according to those who wield its power. And this is, here's, here's an example. So the, I'm just going to read some of the rules for you, some of the good ones. All right. So he, he lays this out. He says, number one, power is not only what you have but what the enemy thinks you have, right? Isn't that amazing, right? So if you, it, the power, your ability to act, it doesn't just come from you being able to act, your talents, your skills, etc. It also comes from what those whom you are trying to change perceive you as having. They're going to give you an imaginary power over themselves. So again, you immediately have his ability, therefore, to say, well, cultivate your image appear to be much more powerful than you actually are right? now this is not what the lord would want us to do this is not because there's nothing more truly powerful than authenticity it's just that authenticity might not win over a crowd but this is where i i go against Alinsky and i say leadership is not just about winning over a crowd saul leadership is about making a true impact for the good in the lives of others and the good is not just an end to be achieved, perhaps at the end of many evil actions. The good is something to be claimed at every single instance of our life. Here, the Christian leader div diverts radically from Saul Linsky and says, power is, in fact, comes from what you have. It comes from what you are. It comes from your faith. Now, will that be effective in the world? Well, of course, we want it to be. And, we, and, and we, we fight for that to happen, but we don't forsake that principle for the sake of efficiency because then that efficiency is fraudulent and void. In the end, you might be able, to, using his tactics, to sway the world for a period of five, ten years at a time, but it'll swing back again, and he says as much. He's like, this whole world is a matter of actions and reactions. It's a fluid thing. And I, I want to point against that to say that's not the Christian worldview. And I'm not sure it's the best for leadership either because it reduces leadership to the sway you have over other people instead of saying that leadership is a sacred duty 
to help other people become free. In Alinsky's system, he uses people to create masses, to create numbers, to unite folks, so to speak, not in the quest for each individual's good, but for the attainment of a common cause. We were made for more than causes. I mean, what he's saying here is it's a fine thing if, you're, or if your goal in life is to organize for political change, but our goal as leaders has to be much broader than that. It's not that Alinsky is wrong, it's that he's limited, he's short-sighted. And when you take it as the be-all and end-all of things and as the guide for leadership, well, then you've led your people down a real trap because you've allowed the manifestation and the appearance of things to replace the substance of reality. His second, re his second and third rules are kind of easy. It's don't go outside of the experience of your people and wherever po possible, go outside the experience of the enemy. So you, it's like that, that rule of war. When you're facing an overwhelming force, never divide your own army. Well, his idea is the same thing. He says another way, which is kind of a good way to, to say this, you know, he says, a good tactic is one that your people enjoy. This is rule number six. In other words, stay within the strength, the competencies of your force. This is a great little insight for us when we have to lead our people at work. The first thing they need to do is to get in connection with your people and see where is our strength? Where is it that we hum? Uh, where is it that what, what can we do well and, and we should not force ourselves to do what we know we're going to fail at. When you, when you stretch yourselves outside of the people that you have, you're not actually leading them. You're leading an imaginary army. Leading a real army means getting in touch with those people and then staying in that sweet spot. And so that's a great, the, the, you ought to enjoy what you do and you ought to enjoy the battle that you're waging. There's a, a beautiful lesson even for us who are, you know, leading from the front. You know, you're in this class because you yourselves want to become better leaders. Well, do you enjoy what you're doing? Because if you're outside of your sweet spot, or you're outside of your level of enjoyment and you don't like the fight, eventually you'll burn out. You need to align what you do every day with this deep inner fire inside of you that's your personal genius. Otherwise, you're weak in front of the enemy because the enemy actually probably really wants to do it or your opponent, the, whoever it is that you're facing, they might actually enjoy it. The, the, the team that will enjoy what it does more is most likely to win the game. You know, he keeps on like the eighth rule, keep the pressure on. And the ninth rule, the threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. No, it's just a, he's giving us a whole list of things here and I don't want to get bogged down into the details. But what I want to show you is that in everything that Alinsky focuses in on, he has something in common. He says these, tactics are those consciously deliberate acts by which human beings live with each other and deal with the world around them. In the world of give and take, tactics is the art of how to take and how to give. Here, he says, our concern is with the tactic of taking. And he's focusing us in on that singular tactic, saying that everything that we're doing is about the same thing. It's about how we deal with the situations in the world around us. And like any kind of person who's going to actually win the war, he takes the time to aim. I think for us who are Catholics, who are trying our best to, to evangelize and follow Jesus Christ in our world around us and in our families, we have a lot to learn from this ability that Saul Alinsky is pointing out to us to define the rules of the game and then accordingly choose our tactics. And we're going to see him developing this even more as we continue to read. Father Nathan has founded the St. John Institute, the MBA program that develops students into the leaders of tomorrow by giving them a missionary's heart and an entrepreneur's mind. Visit our website at stjohninstitute.org. Dare great things for Christ. So not all of his tactics are, are laudable, you know, in, in what they do. Uh, 
take for, for example, you know, some of his, his tactics, the 13th rule, he says, pick a target, freeze it, personalize it and polarize it. Here you have, it's an interesting thing I find over and again with his thought. He's almost oblivious to the moments where his thinking produces the exact effect he claims to war against. He would be saying, I'm here to fight for the democratic way and for the freedom of the individual person and the unity of all people. But then he says, if I play my tactics, the best way to do it is to polarize the people. And when I look at our world today, a world, a culture in America that's very much polarized and polarizing, and I rec recognize the forces of that polarization are coming from the media and coming from politicians and coming from the market and economic structures that are all based upon this same way of thinking. I, I look at it and I say, this polarization is actually deliberate. He'll actually make the statement here, which I, I think might be true for all I know. I'm, I'm not criticizing the, you know, the truth of what he might be saying, but it's still strong. He says, all issues must be polarized if action is to follow. For Linsky, again, he claims to be fighting for the, the, the beautiful dignity of every individual, but he groups individuals into masses in order to acquire that dignity. So he'll use entire groups of people po polarizing an enemy, which he says you need to freeze, you need to tar pick a target, freeze it, personalize it, and then polarize it. And he's talking about other people. And he's talking about other people's opinions. And by creating a target out of them for a whole nother group of people, he's going to create an enemy that will then unite his clan in their quest for power. Effective, maybe. Good? No. Not good at all. And this is where our Lord has such a different approach and asks his disciples to act so differently. He actually says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hurt you. Pray for those who persecute you. Is this, you know, as Gibbon, the famous historian, would actually surmise, is this what made the Roman Empire fall? For Gibbon, the Roman Empire fell because Christianity made it weak. Nietzsche will make the same criticism, saying Christianity is a, re is a religion for those who are soft and who are not ready to conquer the world. I think Nietzsche would love to meet Saul Alinsky. This is exactly, it's almost like the morality of Nietzsche, you know, lived out in the political sphere is Saul Alinsky. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with being criticized by such people because on my side, I have the son of God who teaches me a different way of leadership. He's not going to tell me to polarize people in order to cause them to act. Whatever happened to inspiring people or whatever happened to attracting people to getting people to follow you, not because you force them to by, by speaking to them about what they fear or what they hate, but by, by speaking to them of the noble aspirations of what they could achieve. Now, I agree that with Alinsky, he's going to simply smile and say, such is the world as it is. And I would challenge that straight up. And I want to encourage you to challenge that straight up because the tactics that he lays out here in chapter seven and chapter eight, while they might be effective, they I honestly think they're, they're ineffective because the change that he is creating is only the next step in a never ending cycle between action and reaction. And I would challenge you, can we do better than that? Can't we expect more out of our leaders than to be able to marshal our forces effectively to gain power? I think so. I think that leadership obviously has to deal with power and there are systems of injustice that require being righted. And there are leaders that need, that, that galvanize people for the quest for justice and these people should be admired for the good things that they do. I just want to point out, though, that that's not the be-all and end-all of leadership. Once you have power, what then are you going to do? It's one of the rules that he puts, and he, and, and he says it well, when he says that the price that you have for a successful attack is a constructive alternative. You cannot risk being trapped by the enemy in his sudden agreement with your demand and then saying, you're right, we don't know what to do about this issue, now you tell us. In other words, you know, you have to have a better idea. 
And so there he's alluding to something that I think Christianity puts out forthright. I like to say, Saul, before you even go into the battle, you have to know why you're fighting and you cannot forsake that principle in order to win the fight. This I, our Lord teaches us eloquently. Folks, in the end, I, I think that it's really important that we remember the tactic of a Catholic leader is to lead from the soul and never without the soul. And the soul has been claimed by this mystery of the cross where Jesus shows us that no authority and no power can match with the, the, the logic of the love that he shows us on the cross. We are called to lead out of that love, out of the mystery of wisdom that transcends this world. We're not supposed to imitate those who are in the world just because they seem to wield the wor worldly power. Learn from them, yes. Purify their tactics, yes. And see what we can do, yes. But let's always remember the way that Christ has chosen to lead us. The banner that we follow is the royal standard of the, his cross and the adoration of God and the love that God has for us because he is the one who fights for us even though we ply our trades and, and do what we have to do and we're focused on efficiency and we learn like serpents to be sly in this world, we never allow ourselves to be deluded. True leadership is the leadership that God himself teaches us and that the Son of God demonstrates for us. It's a leadership of love, of surrender to God, of principle, of character, and of bold courage to proclaim and live the truth of the cross of Jesus wherever we go. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.